Let me know when you would like me to start, please. Just another minute. Uh, we sure, had 18 sure. participants, so the moment we reach 18, you can start, sir. Sure. We can start, Dr. Lakshman. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. So, as I was saying, um, if we look at why some papers might get rejected, we may have a better idea of how we go about writing and submitting a paper. All right. So, the best way to know is to know what happens when you submit a paper. So, by a process of uh, uh, reverse engineering, if you want to call it that, Look, looking back about how uh, papers are evaluated, you will get a better idea. So what happens when you put a paper to a journal office is that it will be first vetted by the chief editor. He will see the abstract and, and see if it's appropriate for the given journal and if it has some very basic requirements met. And uh, it's very rare that a chief editor rejects a paper, but he has the authority to do so. Uh, then he will then give it to an associate or a sub-editor. I'm an associate editor for the Indian Journal of Surgery. So my chief will you know, we'll have some 15, 20, 30 people, um, or maybe even smaller, depending on the journal concern, five or six people who would ass assist the chief editor in uh, reviewing an article. They then send it to reviewers, depending on the size of the journal and the number of articles submitted, there may be anywhere between 10 to 100 reviewers in a given journal. And once the reviewers send their comments, usually it is sent to about five people. Uh, it's time bound and that's where the big problem is. Usually we give our reviewers three weeks, but that take, take a much longer time. Reviewers give their comments to the associate editor. The associate editor collates it and then sends it to the chief editor and through him, it reaches the author. There can be three kinds of uh, comments that come. It's usually rejection, outright rejection, where there's nothing more you can do about it. The most common thing is either minor or major modifications. Okay, so they'll ask you several questions it is it is a summary of all the points raised by the reviewers. So they'll ask you for several questions, several changes, and offer to you that if you're ready to answer these and make these changes, we will reconsider it. So the authors will get another two, three weeks to resubmit it with the modifications, or the authors have a right to say, look, I don't think your, uh, your critique or your objection is valid, and he must write why it is not valid. And the editors may go back and say, yes, they may agree with you. If they agree with you, they'll accept your paper. If they don't agree with you, they reject your paper. So basically, this is the method. And so you need to know what is it that are you know, leading the editors to reject a paper. Most of the time, it is the substance. All right. So what is adequate substance? What is it that you need to have? you must have a good research question. That is where many people lack. Uh, Maitre mentioned about ambiguity. She mentioned about uh, you know, rhetoric. Those things don't carry any weight. So it may be a very simple, straightforward question, simple, straightforward answers. And if the data, if the data is good, which means the design of the study and the data collection, the two of them together form the data, if they are good, then your paper has a very high chance of being accepted. So what is a good research question? It must be of clinical relevance in a clinical paper. We're talking about clinical studies and if it's molecular biology, it's a different issue. It must be either a very common problem that we see or it must be a very unusual problem. Okay, so if you have these three things in mind, then you will formulate your research question well. 
design is very important the highest value is given to a randomized control trial it's not easy to do a randomized control trial so many times we will have we accept happily prospective studies but with a good number you know good cohort size so that you get more marks collection there must be an actual formal measurement of the sample size there are ways in which you can uh, measure the sample size and if somebody goes through that you'll get better marks and you must have the proper metrics you know i can't give you examples in fetal medicine i'm highly ignorant about it but i can give it to you in uh, in surgery for example if you are studying a retroperitoneal organ like the pancreas or a uh, or a paraaortic lymph node if you have measured the the outcome through ultrasound examination that paper has very little value we all know that you need a minimum of ct scan or an mri to assess the retroperitoneal tissues so it is like that you must have the kind of right kind of measurement that you have done to substantiate the process of giving an answer to your research question and conclusions are very important what happens most of the time we see that either while presenting a paper or while writing you conclude a lot of things but with very little data you have to restrict your conclusions to the data you have provided in that particular study all right that is very important so if you try to have a lot of conclusions five or six points of conclusion with but you have answer to only one of those points the rest of the four points have come from other papers or some textbook reading it cuts no ice you know it's it doesn't 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 impress the edit, editors at all so you need to base your conclusions on the data now where you give your where you submit your paper you know my three touched on it is is important so you need to know where what the interest of that particular journal is for example if you have a global question something that is applicable everywhere you can send it to any 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 global uh, journal okay um, so you'll have to look up in your field what these journals are but if it's a very local problem you know if your study is on the incidents uh, or the outcomes of some very local uh, of you know in a local population then it would only be interested interesting to an editor of a local journal so you need to know the the context of your study before you submit it uh, again you you have of course fetal medicine is a very specialized part but in our field it can be a general surgical question that it or it can be a very specialized uh, laparoscopic solid organ surgery for example so you again based on that you choose which journal you send it to and if you go for impact factor which which is the popularity of a journal the number of times it is uh, it is uh, uh, cited for example the high impact factor journals always uh, it's difficult to get your paper accepted because they they have too many submissions because of their popularity uh, and so they have this much stricter criteria for selection you can use open access journals um, some of them of course allow you to print free but many of them expect some money and uh, i for one will never uh, pay pay for the publication of my research so i have never done that please be aware of predatory journals i won't go into the details but these are journals which have sprung up in large numbers they take anywhere between 5 and 25000 rupees and then then uh, publish your paper very quickly with or without peer review if you if you want to be discredited in the research field this is the way to go okay very quickly if you say claim that you have published it in one of the predatory journals your your peers you know will will discount your work so never even try that and to know whether it is a predatory journal or not you know you have two methods you must know whether the journal you are submitting to uh, is indexed or not so you have i won't go into the details but there are two main uh, indexes that you need to go if you see whether it is on pubmed or not or see whether it is there on scopus or not these are the two things and outside these you also have the doaj okay uh, please remember this directory of open access journals so you check three areas one is pubmed scopus and doaj if you check these and if the journal that you are intending 
to send the paper to figure in one of these three, then you're on safe ground. If that journal is not on any of these, it's a predatory journal. Please also note that these predatory journals name themselves very close to the what I call legal journals. Okay. And then it may be just a D or, uh, you know, something, just one word may be different in that. So please be very careful uh, to make sure that the, the name of the journal that you're searching for is correctly spelt and um, that all the components are spelt out. Okay. So if you want the best chances for acceptance, please go to this, okay, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. It's a very nice website. A lot of free material is available for you to read and learn about what the, what the you know, it's, 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 a, it's a site put up by medical journal editors. So you know exactly what they want. And I will skip through the rest of it because some of this has already been uh, covered by my three and uh, I'll take questions and uh, maybe have a discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Lakshman. That's indeed quite a challenging situation. And I'm glad that you touched upon, you know, the reasons for rejection. Um, what um, would like to know is, um, you know, obviously uh, India specific and the kind of uh, situation that we are in, uh, we had huge amount of data uh, in our center for example, uh, but, uh, you know, for pregnancy, really, the validity of our data is based upon the outcomes of the pregnancy, really, if you are looking at some prospective fetal problem and the outcomes. And if you are looking at very specific outcomes, for example, there is a fetal abnormality, then pretty much, uh, you know, we have the outcome on those pregnancies. However, when scans are normal, for example, to see how many missed anomalies are there, uh, it's very, very challenging to get the outcomes because either they have changed places, they have changed their phone numbers. And, you know, this is something that I have struggled from day one, although we have a system in place uh, to collect the outcomes for the last 15 years. But the biggest challenge I face is that, you know, our people don't respond back in time and, you know, it's quite a struggle. Now, to say that this data is good, right, given the yeah. circumstances, I know that, you know, my a professor always says you should have 95 to 98 percent outcomes of the pregnancy then only the study is valid otherwise it's invalid i mean he will not even look at data which has got less than 95 percent outcomes now i know it's a very uh, difficult question for you to answer but you know it's like you doing very straightforward surgeries but trying to find out the long-term outcome of these surgeries because that's also important right what looks straightforward in the front you know we don't know what are the other problems that can be hidden maybe which will develop a year later or two years later so how do we kind of you know how do you address this and what do you suggest should be the yeah. way forward thank you well it, it is a very relevant question and as you say it is a challenge in this country because follow-up is very difficult but the first thing we have to understand is that for every case that we do just collect the data and put it, you know, nowadays it's very easy to have a good um, Excel sheet or even a database. Keep the data and keep two or three kinds of contact information. Okay. Landline, we always have a landline, the mobile line uh, and the uh, email for all the patients and of course a postal address. And you, your professor obviously is very tough because you know, 98% or 90% fall up, particularly long term, is almost impossible. But 60% is acceptable. All right. We have, we call repeatedly uh, landline or mobile or write to them and ask them for a follow up. And we have studies published where we have 11 year follow up on uh, our patients with ventral hernia, for example, you know, so we had, a, as you know, the recurrence of a hernia is, has to be measured at least two years later to say that your method is good. Five is preferable, 10 is, is very good. So based on that, we published a paper on a minimum five-year follow-up of about 300 of uh, ventral hernia patients. And, you know, we 
we called 500 people and we got 300. But we had good enough data and we said that. And, and the other thing is today, telephonic interview is considered quite valid. It need not be an in-person interview. Even if they're out of town, um, they don't have to come to you for the follow-up. You have a, a robust questionnaire. And uh, if you ask that, uh, you know, of these, as I told you, 300 people on whom we had a long-term follow-up, um, 60, 70% were telephonic. The other 30% had, we had in-person uh, interview and examination. So I think if you keep trying hard, it is hard work. Uh, I must uh, compliment my juniors for, per, for their persistence. So if you do that, you will get a 60% follow-up. And as you said, we have quite good numbers, large numbers in the way we work. And so you will have the follow-up on a good number of patients. That's very heartening to hear 60%. We have about yeah. 70 to 80%. And certain yeah. times we go even up to 80, 85, but um, it's almost very impossible good. to reach 90, 95% uh, oh. unless it's a very short term and it's kind of very, very specific with small numbers and things Correct. like that. Correct. But, Correct. Uh, Anyway, that was very heartening to know that because I always wonder how people get this kind of very long term outcomes because there are so many fetal conditions where yeah. we need to know what happens, you know, four years, five years, 10 years down the line. And of course, you know, our parents do get annoyed, <laughs> which is sometimes we you know why people are faced with. But anyway, yeah. there is a good way to deal with it. There is, you know, the ways we can deal with it. So what are the, I mean, if you're finding, you know, the other, uh, you know, question, you know, which comes to our mind, I mean, you said that, you know, we have to find uh, uh, questions of clinical relevance. Now, can you just, um, I know it's like, um, if we can just highlight on that part, how do you choose a research question and how many components should go into choosing the research question? Yeah. Because this is something that I keep telling uh, my fellows and uh, I don't like to spoon feed. I want them to think about it and then really? come back and tell me what they want to do rather than me telling them what to do. Because correct. unless they put on their thinking caps, uh, they will not be able to do the job correctly. So can you just take us through yeah, perfect, how to perfect. systematically go about yeah. asking a proper question? Yeah, perfect. You know, uh, you will have to make do with uh, with surgical examples because of my great ignorance no, about fetal no, no, medicine. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> right, that's absolutely that's fine. But I just want them right. to put them in those scenarios yes. where they think about it because yeah. they're exposed to the, uh, you know, they're exposed to the fetal scans. Yeah. And I want them to keep their thinking caps on. Yeah. No, the very first thing is, uh, I must compliment you on insisting that you must, they must put their thinking caps on. That's the whole idea of research. Uh, you know, where a senior tells you what to do doesn't doesn't work at all. They must learn to think for themselves. That's a very, very good thing. See, the first thing that people think that you think is that you must do some earth shattering research for you to be accepted and, uh, you know, uh, for you to be recognized. Simply not true. Okay. What you can do is ask, there are two or three things where you get your research topics research questions. A, just think of the normal things that we do and see whether it helps or not. I'll give you an example. Should you drain after you've done a lap collie or not? You know, you put a drain in the subhepatic space. Is it worth it? What is good? What is not? So you do hundreds of lap collies, you then ask that research question and then you form a protocol which tells you what is the pain, what is the recovery area, how many people had a leak, how many people had a hematoma, how many people needed a re-intervention. And you will quickly prove that putting a drain is unnecessary and if at all, it will give more pain and discomfort. That is a study in itself. Should you put a Ryle's tube after you have done a colonic resection? We all start with the idea that there is an ileus Gast, you know, gastric ileus, bowel ileus, and you know, small and large bowel, and people get you know an acute dilatation of the stomach if you don't put a Ryle's tube. Simply not true. Just ask a question: Is is a Ryle's tube necessary or not after a colectomy? And you you know design a study to look at various aspects, and then you have one one study there already. Simple questions like that in your day to day practice. 
the second thing is that you are doing you are going about doing something and you look at the literature looking at the literature is very very important you, you know people post graduates i keep telling them they must keep scanning the journals because they don't go beyond textbooks if you don't go beyond textbooks you can't have your thinking cap on and you can't do any research so keep scanning the journals and you say uh, i am i am again a surgical example these are the studies that we have done uh, or we have looked at so you 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 are doing a routine painkillers for uh, laparoscopic surgery very little pain in laparoscopic surgery but you then measure how much painkillers that you give and then somebody says look i have done a tap block for a laparotomy where there is more pain there is what's called a tap block now would you would that help in laparoscopy you know i know that the pain in laparoscopy is less but if i do a tap block in addition to my usual analgesics or instead of my usual analgesics will it be even better so you then have a study so you when you when there is no answer you know in the literature for example no no evidence of tap block in laparoscopy so that's a question that you have so that's a research question so this is the way you think about it and the third question is you know so much is written in the west but very little in india we are at, at a relative advantage here because there is very little documentation in india and so this is the time when we have to document and the youngsters have a golden opportunity to get their work published some study that is done in the west can be completely repeated in india and you can send it to an indian journal and say look we have we have a paucity of indian data these are all western we need to go with our own data and that's why we this, we did this study that's your introduction and most indian journals will accept it thank you so much uh and next comes to the next challenge that we do have is with statistics right um i mean how do you deal with that i mean <laughs> you know, to find a good statistician uh, yeah. is the first search then uh, you know to make sense of what they have said or to try to communicate with them because most of them are non medical yeah, uh, yeah so the final result is uh, what i have realized is i end up with sitting with google and doing my own statistics and put it up yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> you know that's a very very important challenge uh, the only answer is that surgeons must learn the basics of statistics it's very challenging it's very boring but you have to go through it because in a research workshop we have a full module on statistics and uh, i have a colleague uh, ramakrishna who is very good at it and he he has even written a book about it the surgeon practicing surgeon in badravati who has a lot of interest and in, you know so but what is very you raised a very relevant point that statisticians even in medical colleges you know preventive so and so uh, pns departments will have statisticians working in medical setup even they do not understand the nuances you know they'll just run an anova they'll just run a chi square or a t test and then give you results and many times they get it completely wrong so you must understand you know what test has to be applied for your cohort and you must tell him this is what i want you to apply many times the whole thing is derailed because the wrong test is employed so you must understand basically that much of it and i would uh, recommend that if, if if you go to the link that i have given a research workshop link then ram krishna has put up a lot of this material on his own website it's called lakshmi nursing home dot uh, in or something like that i forget but it, you get that information there and so he has given you links to a lot of sites which you know he has some himself he has put in put, put down some calculators himself he has also given a lot of links to various sites which tell you what test to apply that is very important okay so you can educate yourself slowly it, it won't happen overnight it will take you maybe a year or two before you understand uh even the you know the basics of statistics but an effort must be made to read up statistics a lot of free material is available on the net and so our boys just forget about it you know they get bored and they don't even look at it so what we do in our journal clubs 
is to always quiz them on some statistical aspect. You know, always in our journal club discussion, there will always be some discussion on statistics. And so it makes them go and look up and learn and uh, it helps. But yes, uh, do not blindly follow what the statistician says. You must do some reading and understand which test to apply for your kind of study. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, that's exactly our, been our experience as well. I mean, we have paid the statistician, but I've ended up doing it all myself eventually. Uh, and now the final question, I think, uh, if, uh, is that, um, you know, case presentations, case uh, discussions, you know, like taking uh, just a few cases, the level of rejection is quite high. Yes. Uh, when it comes to solitary case presentations or, you know, maybe if you have two, three, how, but what I notice is majority of the people, they want to do the case discussions because it's an easy way out, right? Now, but at the same time, journals do accept case cases, case studies as well. So what is it that should guide us, you know, which type of cases should we select to present as case discussion so that the you know the rejection acceptance is more and yeah, it is case yeah case uh, discussions case uh, histories are not accepted in journals in the, in the mainstream journals uh, please note that there are certain journals which are designed for case reports so you may consider sending it to them uh, but some majority of them, as I know, are paid journals. So it's that's not an option for me. I never pay for this. Um, but in the mainstream journals, for example, Indian Journal of Surgery, you hardly ever see case reports. But the ones that are accepted have two main characteristics. It is an extremely unusual case. You know, you don't see such cases at all. Um, and uh, so it's very, very rare. Or the second thing is that it is a positive outcome for in an unusual case with a very simple innovation or an improvement on some kind of intervention that you've done. It's, it's as simple as that. For example, if you, if you have, um, again, I have to give you surgical examples. If you find that in a laparoscopic uh, bile duct damage okay which happens all the time you have managed to get a stoppage of a leak from something very un un unconventional like a slow or a low suction drainage rather than a tube drainage or any other intervention and you reduce the the fistula rate from say two, two or three months to two weeks, such a, such a case report would be accepted so that that is the starting point for a bigger study. You see, some new or novel idea has come into the treatment. We know that it is not valid because it is anecdotal, because it's only one or two or three cases. But because it has happened this often, it is worth pursuing a study. So in the case report, you say that I'm doing this unusual, you know, I'm presenting this unusual uh, intervention that was successful and uh, you say we can't we can't go by this unless we have studies with larger numbers but because it is a novel idea people will accept it okay um thank you very much uh, dr lakshman any other quick questions from anybody else because we are already reached 8 30 i think everybody has to go to their respective i'm just a small question Sure. Um, uh, sir, in case if our study is rejected, like after how much time frame do we have to resubmit it to another journal? And, and unless the until next day, the next day you can submit it. You know, I'll tell you what we have. We have a hierarchy of journals. It has five or six journals. Okay. So we say our first submission will be to journal A. And the day we get a rejection, it will go to journal B. And the day we get a rejection from journal B, it will go to journal C. All right, it goes like that. And, I think what uh, you have to keep in. Sorry, yeah. Go on, go on. Sorry, please complete. No, no, sir, you please complete. Yeah. So what you have to do is that have this manuscript ready, send it to journal A, 
I have put it there that you must read read the instruction to authors from each of the journals. They are slightly different. The way you give your references, the way you you annotate them, and things like that. So as soon as one journal rejects us, we go back to our manuscript, make the minor changes. It can be done in 24 hours. The minor changes that are required to make this ready for the next journal whose instructions may be a little different and then submit it to them it's, it's as simple yeah. as that but never do that's, it concurrently that is unethical so that's what it's, i was trying to point out right? because yeah. they will have different instructions so you have to go through the instructions before submitting it to the next one right so i think yeah so, so thank you very much dr lakshman so Most we'll welcome. probably have you back sometime soon anytime uh, because uh, we have just started working on some studies which we would like to submit uh, by yeah. the end of this month or early next week. Uh, sure. early next week. So thank you very much and have a Thank you for day. the opportunity. Uh, yeah. Dr. Purnima, I think uh, the question that you have raised, what are the main components of research study has already been covered by uh, Maitre and so you will be able to go through that in the recording. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, sir. Goodbye. Thank uh, you, Maitri, sir. if you can, yeah, kindly let me have the recording, please. Sure, sir. I'll share it with you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye.